as I've said in previous videos before, some of these episodes are going to be companies that I want to share that may have some sort of uh, educational insight that I, I want to share on the channel. Uh, and other times we'll be doing requests. We've done a lot of requests recently, so today we're going to do one that I've picked. Today we're going to take a look at Sainsbury's. <laughs> Hey there guys, welcome to the FTSE show with me, Chris Chillingworth. Uh, this is the show where we take apart FTSE stocks, so UK only, for those that are asking for European companies every every single episode. Um, we're only doing UK at the moment. We have gone through the FTSE 100, the FTSE 250, the FTSE small cap, the FTSE fledgling indexes, and we're about to start the FTSE AIM market, uh, of which there are about 700 companies to go through. And that's me and my team that go through and analyze all these companies. I do the analysis, my team do all the data entry, build the, web, the, the spreadsheets for me, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so over the course of the year, we're finding more and more companies. We're finding companies we don't want to invest in and we're finding companies we do want to invest in. This show is all about showcasing the whole range of different companies that we find. So as you can see, we've uh, found some companies that are very, very good companies uh, financially that are showing all the hallmarks of having high odds that they are going to grow over the next 10 or 20 years. We're also showcasing companies that do not make the grade. Now I noticed a little bit of frustration in some of the comments from people saying when are you going to give us another 100 point company? So far out of the hundreds of companies that we have analysed we've only found about 5-6% of them meet our grade. Um, I will be showcasing more of them in the future episodes for sure, absolutely. But not every episode. And I think it's important that we share the rough with the smooth, you know, the great companies and the poor companies, because it adds perspective. It shows us why those great companies are such great companies when you're looking, when the vast majority of these indexes are filled with the likes of BP, Tesco, Vodafone, Centricas, you know, uh, Aston Martin, these poor companies that are not producing results um, that are that have very poor odds of growing over the next 10 or 20 years. It gives us that perspective. It gives us that kind of spectrum of this is what is great. And the rest of it is the reason why it's great. These are This is the reason why the likes of uh, Auto Trader, Taylor Wimpy, Diageo are great companies. Because this is the rest of the pot. And it's nowhere near good enough. So it adds perspective and I think it's very important. And so throughout this show, I'm not just going to showcase the best companies only. We're going to take a look at everything. And today we're going to take a look at Sainsbury's PLC. Now we've already looked at Tesco's earlier on in this series. So it'll be interesting to compare the Sainsbury's result with Tesco. Tesco have already gone off our board. They got relegated a while back. Um, they scored minus 60 points when they were on the show. Um, so today we're going to go through Sainsbury's. We're going to take a look, see what we think, and uh, come back to the leaderboard at the end. Okay, let's go into Sainsbury's then. Epic Code SBRY. They're in the FTSE 100 and they're the, uh, in the food and drug retail sector. So as we can see straight off the bat, revenue been going up for sure. We're looking at uh, 18.9 billion in 2009. Went up to 23 billion by 2013. It stayed at 23 billion then for quite some time. Actually from 2012, 2013 all the way up to 2016, stuck at 23, 23 billion every year. I if I was saying million earlier or a billion earlier, but it's 23 billion and they were there for four years, not able to grow, not really going anywhere. And then in 2017, the price, the, the revenue started to go up, up to 26 billion, 28 billion, 29 billion in 2019. And that is largely due to the acquisition of Argos that happened in 2016. And you can see from the numbers very, very easily that from 2016, uh, revenue has been going up since then. So the acquisition of Argos has been uh, successful in that respect in so much that it's brought a higher revenues in and it looks like the company's growing again, which is great. Um, looking at cost of sales or more importantly, the gross margin, as you can see from 2009 all the way to 2015. So that's what, seven years. Uh, these guys enjoyed a gross margin of about 5.5% on average per year. So they take the the revenue that comes in, you take away from that the cost of being able to do what they do. So we're not talking about expenses or utilities, wages or anything like that at all. Just the cost of the product, products that they sell. Um, so the cost price, essentially. Well, what the, the percentage that's left over, 
So from the revenue that comes in against the cost of bringing those products in, uh, it was 5%, 5.5% a year, and it was consistent at that level. So this is a highly competitive industry, the supermarket industry. You know, the, the markup that they make from these products, they have to sell huge amounts of volume to make decent profits uh, because the, the, the margins are so thin. Um, a 5.5% margin is something straight off the bat I'm not interested in. I can tell straight away that this is going to be difficult uh, and not a company I'm probably going to be interested in uh, and the supermarket industry itself is something that I tend to stay away from. Um, but still, really interesting to go through these numbers, so let's continue just to see just how things are with this company. Um, you can see from 2016 onwards, the margins actually increased. So since the acquisition of Argos, their gross margin has increased. Uh, up to 6% uh, then clearing in pretty close to 7% in 2019. Um, so what that basically is telling us that revenue is going up and the cost of sales is going up but not quite to the same extent, not quite to the same rate. And they've managed to kind of squeeze a little bit more out of that gross margin from 5.5% to getting close to 7% now per year on the gross gross margin. Um, so that's a positive, it's still far too low, but it's, it's nice to see that things are moving in the right direction there. Uh, one of my main issues is with the expenses of this company. As you can see from 2010 to all the way to uh, 2014, uh, these guys were posting on average about 35% expenses. So that's 35% of the gross profit now that we're working off, not the revenue, but the gross profit. So revenue minus cost of sales gives us a gross profit. And then what percentage of that gross profit is eaten up by the expenses? That is the wages. That is the utilities. It's the rents and all that kind of stuff of running the business. Uh, and we're looking at 35%, which is very healthy. It's a very healthy percentage of uh, the the gross profit being eaten up by expenses. That's a company that you know you can do something with that. However, in 2015, we saw a enormous spike to 93.7%. So of the gross profit, 93, nearly 94% was eaten up by expenses, a value sum of 1.1 billion in expenses. I don't know if that's got anything to do with the Argos acquisition in 2016, the following year. It may well have something to do with that. Um, but there was an enormous spike that uh, cost them essentially three times as much uh, expenses all in one year, just came through a massive wave. Uh, and if we were to read through the annual reports, we'll probably find out why that was. It may well have something to do with the, the 2016 acquisition of Sainsbury's, perhaps. Um, but the the expenses have been downhill since that acquisition. So that was in 2016. Uh, at that point, the expenses had gone back to about $850 million, which was about 60%. Uh, that percentage then went up to 74% the next year in 2017, up to 75% in 2018. And then unfortunately in 2019, it's gone up to 86%. 86% of the profit is now being eaten up by expenses, 1.7 billion. Remember, this is a company that was, spend, was spending 35% a year on expenses for, you know, from 2010 all the way down to 2014, uh, which is essentially 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. You're looking at five years there of consistency in terms of their expenses. If anything, those expenses were falling from about 35 down to 32%. Then the acquisition of Argos has come in. We've seen that spike in 2015. And then it's gone up from 60% to 74 to 75 to 86%. Uh, that's, in, that's an incredible amount. Their gross profit is two, two, two billion. Uh, they're spending 1.7 billion on expenses. So there's very little left for this company and for the shareholders after that. Um, looking at interest on debt, interest on debt has been going down, but because of the operating profit falling as well, because of those expenses, these increased expenses, uh, the percentages have actually been going up. So, But let's go skip to the, the really important stuff here, which is the net earnings, the profit. So Sainsbury's are a company that from 2009 all the way to 2014 were making about 2.2% on average every single year. And you could almost set your watch by it every year, about 2.1 or 2.2% they were making every year. 
Uh, it's a small, very small margin, certainly not a margin that I'm particularly interested in whatsoever, but it's very consistent and common with supermarkets. This industry is a highly competitive industry, and the margins are always thin. You can find that in te looking at Tesco's, you can find that looking at Asda, you know, they've all got very small margins, and, and Sainsbury's were the same. Then 2015 came along, and they made a losing year. They lost 0.8% or 179 million uh, so despite bringing in 23.7 billion, they still lost money that year. <laughs> they lost 180 million. So that just goes to show just how expensive it's cost them to run the business that year. If they can bring in 23 million, 23.7 billion, I should say, and have nothing left to show for it at the end of the year, in fact, make a loss. That's incredible. Uh, but then since the acquisition in Argos in 2016, things have just been going downhill. So they posted a 1.6% net earnings, then the next year 0.8, the next year 0.9, so a very tiny increase. Then the most recent year, 2019, down to 0.6% net earnings. So looking at 2019 only, this is a company that's brought in 29 billion in revenue and only kept 177 million of that, 0.6%. So... That's a huge amount of revenue, 29 billion. Cost of sales is 27 billion. Straight away, they're down to 2 billion in gross profit. Then you add those very high expenses at 1.7 billion, that leaves you with 275 million. Interest on debt added, taxes added, and you're left with very little, 177 million, 0.6%. Uh, and what I'm more worried about is since the acquisition of Argos, it's gone from 1.6 to 0.8 down to 0.6. So, this is a company, again, before the Argos acquisition, happily making 2.2% every single year. Some years a little bit higher than that. And now we've got a company that's fallen from 1.6 down to 0 0.6 in the last four years since the acquisition. And so that's a concern for me. What that's telling me is obviously revenue has gone up following the acquisition of Argos. Cost of sales has gone up, but not quite to the same amount. But what's crippling them is the huge jump in expenses. This is a company making, uh, there's a company spending about 420 million every year from 2009 to 2014. 420 million on expenses. It's now gone from, uh, jumped up to 850 million, then 1.2 billion, 1.4 billion, and 1.7 billion over the last four or five years from 400 million to 1.7 billion in expenses. It's huge. Uh, and it looks like the acquisition of Argos is absolutely costing them in expenses, significantly so, that it's wiping out pretty much most of the profits for the shareholders. So, I mean, I hope that there's some sort of long-term goal there for Sainsbury's, where they can turn that around, where they've got expectations to turn that around. But looking at the facts, things are all going in the wrong direction since the acquisition. Let's take a look at the balance sheet and move on. Um, so, the current ratio is at 0.7. It's always been pretty low. 0 0.5, 0 0.6 most years, now sitting at 0 0.7, so slight improvement in the current ratio. But it's still a concern for me. Uh, when we look at the current liabilities, the short-term liabilities that are owed within the next year or so, looking at 11.4 billion. Looking at the short-term assets, the, the stuff that t traditionally would bring money into their pockets, we're looking at a value of 7.5 billion. So that's a huge difference. Um, looking at the liabilities, the uh, accounts payable. So this is invoices owed uh, that need to be paid by Sainsbury's. So owed to other companies, essentially. 4.4 billion. Looking at the uh, accounts receivables, money owed to Sainsbury's that hasn't been paid yet, 661 million. So, I mean, that's dwarfed by the liabilities, for sure. Uh, and, yeah, it's, it's, that's a concern for me. And most of their assets come from the column other assets, which I hate because it gives us no indication of really what they are. Um, whereas the liabilities are pretty high. I want to look at debt. Debt's an issue for me as well here because when we look at the short term debt borrowing, it's jumped up in the last four years from 223 to 608 to 832 million. So that's gone up from 223 million to 832 million in the last four years. And prior to that, they were, they were borrowing nowhere near as much with their short term borrowings. So that's quite an increase in debt, first of all. And this is short term debt. This is debt that's got to be paid within the next year or so. Uh, and so when you've got a company here that's only making about 177 million recently, 
uh, in profit, and they've got 832 million in short-term debt. That's a concern for me. Uh, that's quite a, a huge amount of debt relative to the earnings power of this business. But then we can also add on to that the long-term debt. Now, as you can see here, if you're watching this on the video, uh, long-term debt, they've been making some some efforts to bring this net debt down by the looks of things because uh, 2015 it was sitting at 2.5 billion, then down to 2.2, then down to 2, then 1.6, then 950 million in the last year. So uh, 950 million long-term debt, 832 short-term debt so you combine that together you've got about just under 1.8 billion in outstanding debt 1.8 billion for a company making 177 million profit a year to me that's a concern to me that's just too much debt relative to their earnings power uh, years ago maybe they would have been able to cope with that back when they were making you know four five six hundred million profit a year but those days are gone, it seems, and they're now down to making only about 177 million a year. So I'm concerned about the debt levels for sure. Uh, and we can look at the liability, the uh, the equity of the company. Equity of the company has been going up. So that's essentially what are the value of the assets? What are the value value of the, all the liabilities uh, owed by the business in various different degrees and formats? Uh, take the liabilities away from the assets. What's left? Whatever's left is the equity of the business, and they're sitting at about 8.4 billion, and that has been going up most years. Uh, it's been a bit stagnant from uh, from about 2011 to 2015. They didn't really grow. They kind of sat at about 5.5 billion, but since 2016, the equity of the business has been increasing. So the assets are going up. The uh, and, and they're going up faster than the liabilities, which is great. That's a good sign since that acquisition. So they've obviously acquired a lot of buildings, property, staff, you know, all these different assets that have grown faster than the liabilities. However, the profits just aren't coming in. They're still far too high in expenses. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we've seen we've obviously seen the revenue growth with that, but the expenses of this business are ripping away any of the profits, unfortunately. And that's something that we'd need to address pretty damn soon. Otherwise, if it continues in that way, then they could end up some posting some losing years in the near future. Um, looking at retained earnings, really healthy as well. Again, stagnant from 2011 to about uh, 2017, retained earnings really couldn't breach past the kind of 3.3 billion mark. It's a great number to have in there, but it wasn't growing. And then in 2018, that's gone up to 3.7 and now 4.7 billion. So a whole billion went in to retained earnings in the last year, which is great. Uh, and that gives you a lot more security, knowing that 4.7 billion is sitting in retained earnings right now. Uh, that, that's great. The return on shareholder equity is very poor. It's down at 2.1%. So that means of all the equity this company has, 8.4 billion, you would expect to be make that expect them to be making more in terms of profit. Unfortunately, they're only making that 177 million as a result of that. The return on shareholder equity is very low. So here we've got a company that's performing in a very competitive industry. Revenue's going up. Cost of sales is going up, but nowhere near as fast, which is great. That means the slice of the pie is that a little bit bigger. But unfortunately, the expenses are just going up far too quickly since the acquisition of Argos. And they've managed to reach this point now where the expenses are taking up nearly 87% of any profits. And it's leaving them with very little at the end of the year. And unfortunately, that's a big concern for me because the since that acquisition, everything's been pointing downwards. Uh, and, and the results, the performance, the actual profits have all been pointing downwards despite looking like the company is actually growing in terms of its assets and, and its size, which it clearly has following the acquisition of Argos. So um, let's go and take a look at the chart. Okay, so this is the chart for Sainsbury. Uh, yeah, we can see here that in the numbers, we've seen the downward trajectory in the numbers in terms of the results of the company. Yes, they've grown in terms of assets. Yes, they've grown in terms of equity. Following the acquisition, they've they've now owned probably far more stores and staff and equipment, uh, having bought out that company home retail group. But uh, it's not helped them in terms of any revenue coming in. It's not helped them in terms of any actual profit coming in. The expenses have jumped faster than the revenue has, which is a concern. And we can see here, you know, share price will generally reflect the actual results of a business, not necessarily what their potential is. 
and as we can see from 2008 where their share price was up at sort of five pound eighty uh coming down to sort of december 2019 prior to the outbreak uh from five pound eighty a share two pound a share and since then we've fallen underneath two pound a share so yeah this is not a company that i would be looking to invest in over the next 10 or 20 years now my outlook on this is to find a company that's going to grow over the next 10 20 years that's going to grow sort of 300 400% over that period of time and this is not the sort of company that's going to achieve that they could achieve it don't get me wrong Sainsbury's could turn it all around and they could get there and I can't possibly know that no one can possibly know that right now and so all we've got to kind of play on is what are the odds what are the odds that a company that have posted in these sorts of results probably not going to change too much over the next few years that are falling in numbers falling in profits How, what's the odds that they're going to be jumping up free 400 percent in share price value over the next 20 years well the odds of this company doing that are very low compared to some of the other companies i've found where the odds are much much higher and it's for that reason i'm not interested in this company the odds are very unlikely that this is going to be a company that's going to achieve that for me uh, based on, on the analysis here, based on looking at where Sainsbury's are going. Do I think Sainsbury's are particularly in trouble? Not really. Uh, they've got big, decent retained earnings in there. Uh, they are growing as a company. They're just not bringing in those profits. If they can find a way to reduce those expenses going out and make, we make some cuts in the business, they'll probably be able to turn it around and get back to their 2% a year and kind of stay there for the next 20 years, which is typically what we tend to see from the likes of Tesco as well. Um, but who knows, maybe they'll be able to turn it around. The odds are against it happening though. And so for that reason, I would rather put my money in a company where the odds are much higher of the me getting the results I'm looking for. Um, so with that said, let's go and take a look at the leaderboard. Okay, so something that I've got into the habit of doing now is talking about the price. Sainsbury's trading at a price of £1.92, right? Um, the earnings per share score right now is about nine pence. That's a 4.6% return on your investment on a per share basis. So that's quite low. That's suggesting that the share price is probably a little bit too high um, based on the earnings power of this business. Uh, dividend yield is 1.7%, so they're not a great dividend stock either. I, I mean, even I, I don't pick dividend stocks. I pick sh on share price growth and the potential for share price growth. But even then, I'm finding that the majority of companies that I pick have dividend yields of, of greater than 1.7%. So I'd say that's quite low. Um, they've got a price to book ratio of 0 0.5. So you could argue the price is probably... Uh, around where it needs to be, if not a little bit too high. Um, I'm not a fan of Sainsbury, as you can tell. Uh, they are very similar to Tesco, and you find all of these supermarket companies tend to be very similar. Uh, very different sizes between them, but the margins are always so thin, and it doesn't take much to cause a losing year. And losing years for me are a no-no. I'm not interested in companies that are posting losing years, even if it was just a couple. Um, because it has such an adverse effect on share price and on investor confidence uh, and things like that. I'm looking for uh, company, the best companies in the indexes. And so when you look at a company making 0.6% return, these are not the best companies in the indexes and they, they do not have the greatest odds of growing at the size I want them to grow. They may well achieve it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they can't possibly achieve 300, 400% growth over the next 10, 20 years. How can I possibly know that? No one knows whether what, whether they're going to do that. But what I do know is that looking at the research, looking at the numbers, looking at the financials, the odds are certainly against them compared to other companies in the index of them achieving that. And for, it's for that reason that I'm not picking uh, to invest in Sainsbury's. Um, so let's get them up on the board. So SBRY is the epic code here. We're not expecting great things, of course, here. We've seen the numbers. We know it doesn't look good. Uh, you may have just noticed I've got my red pen out. Uh, that's how bad it is, unfortunately. Tesco scored minus 60 points. Sainsbury scored minus 54. So 
slightly better, hardly anything in it, pretty much the same as Tesco. Um, they don't even make it onto the leaderboard. That is the the caliber. The, the caliber of the leaderboard is growing. It's getting better and better because these poor companies are getting kicked off as better companies come in. So as we go through the show, the top 30 companies on this list are going to be better and better companies. There's not much room. I mean... I mean, we've only got six companies in red pen now left on the board, and they are going to get kicked off over time as we add some new companies to this list that score higher. So, unfortunately, Sainsbury's don't even make it onto the board. Um, thank you very much for watching, guys. I always appreciate your support. These videos are getting hundreds of likes now, thousands of views. It's absolutely awesome i never thought we were going to get this kind of level of traction uh and it just seems to keep growing we're hitting uh, i posted on facebook the other day we hit a thousand new views a day on the channel now it's a thousand faces a thousand people looking at our of our channel every single day amazing uh when you put it into perspective and a youtube perspective it's nothing you know but there's people out there blowing up watermelons and getting millions of views you know uh, i mean it's they obviously know what works and what people are interested in um this is very niche and i appreciate not many people want to look at my face and listen to my analysis uh, you'd have to be really into your stocks to be interested in this. Uh, but the fact that there's a thousand different people out there watching the videos on a daily basis, and bear in mind we only put two videos out uh, a week, so it's not going to be the same thousand people every day. That's awesome. It's amazing. And it's just the power of the internet, I suppose. But anyway, I'm talking rubbish. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I really do appreciate the support, and I will see you guys in Thursday's episode. Cheers. Cheers.